Uh, now we'd like, I'd like to introduce Todd Dawson, who's professor of the Departments of Integrative Biology and Environmental Science Policy and Management. His research is focused on the interface between plants and their environments with a special emphasis on a functional perspective. Welcome, Todd. Yeah, I thought, wow, my name's changed. Thank you. I want to extend my thanks also to the Philomathia uh, Foundation, to the organizers of this day and a half or day and three quarters, and uh, all of you for attending. And those of you who are uh, at the session this morning heard from uh, Administrator Lisa Jackson that she was in California and that we should lose the suits and become grassroots. So I've taken her orders here. <laughs> taken off the tie and we're going to look at an example here that's very grassroots, that's very much California and that's thinking about um, the issue of our redwood forest here in California and climate change and how we're going to be, how we have been using science to really sort of inform conservation and stewardship uh, strategies as water becomes more limited um, under drought. Some of you know that California's redwoods really inhabit a climate zone, um, both in the Sierra Nevada and along the coast of California here, that are incredibly sensitive to water limitation. And the recent trends that you saw this morning of increasing temperatures are leading to longer summertime droughts and clear impacts on forest water balance. As Chris pointed out and Bill as well in their talks this morning, we here that have the redwood forests and, and visit them we live in a Mediterranean climate zone, and it's been uh, very much impacted not only by climate change, but also human use of the Mediterranean zones. And there's a lot of competition for water resources in these water-limited environments that indeed are having an impact on the redwood ecosystem. These changes are really leaving their mark on, on both of our redwoods. We are fortunate here in the great state of California to actually have two state trees, both redwoods. Uh, sequoia dendron giganteum that lives in the Sierra Nevada, the giant sequoia, and the coast redwood, which is probably living right out here about 10 meters away from this building. Um, and they really, the, the sort of, the changes that are taking place in the climate and the hydrologic cycle are really leaving their mark on these forests. And so there's a real need for more informed, science-informed sort of conservation and management of both the natural stands, but also timberlands that, are, that the water resources um, are also affecting. So one of the things that, that has come up in the last couple of years is trying to find solution-based ways of addressing this issue. This issue, And I've been involved very much in developing a unique partnership between the stakeholders, the public, industry, state and national parks, academics like myself and researchers that are actually out there in the field collecting data, and a very important uh, non-governmental organization here in California to save the Redwood League to really push forward a new agenda for conservation and stewardship of the Redwood Forest here in California. The question that we posed when we started this was what will change most in the future and how do we manage for it? You saw that temperatures are changing, precipitation is changing, snowpack is changing. Uh, I'll share some, with you, share some data with you showing that fog is changing and fog is an important resource for the coastal redwoods. And those changes are also leading to changes in evaporation, which are also very much having an impact on the water balance of both these kinds of redwood forests. To address this issue, we've partnered up. And as I mentioned, with the Save the Redwood League, this is one of California's oldest conservation organizations. They've been around since uh, 1918, they're, so they're in their 95th year. They've partnered up with us here at UC Berkeley, myself, and a senior research associate in my lab, Anthony Ambrose, who's sitting in the audience. Any hard questions, we'll go to him. Um, and Steve Sillett and Bob Van Pelt at Humboldt, uh, Humboldt State University. There's also been some additional people that I'll mention as I, as I move through the rest of the talk. The idea was to establish a research um, agenda that really is focused across a broad range of scales, all the way from the leaf to the landscape is the way we, we like to put it. We're merging a variety of technologies that we feel can really address the, the issue of how climate change and changes in the water cycle are going to impact the redwoods here in, in our state. And I, can't, I don't have time to touch on all of the various things in this slide, but you can see we have 
a variety of different sorts of research foci um, on reference plots, on using dispersed watershed networks, experimentation, uh, remote sensing, and one thing that isn't actually mentioned on this uh, slide here is actually also climate modeling. We are really about trying to do science for conservation and stewardship. And for me, this is a really new endeavor. I'm a scientist who's largely done science to inform and increase knowledge. And this science agenda here is really about taking the science and translating it into policy, into conservation, into stewardship advances to protect the redwoods here in our great state. A real benefit of this new initiative, which we call the RCCI, or the Redwood and Climate Change Initiative, is also involving students in this work. And that has also an education benefit, and it gets the young people in at the grassroots, where they begin to not only get their PhDs while they're doing this, but also get invested in the problem. As we heard this morning, the younger generation is inheriting a mess. And one of the things we can do is to facilitate their ability to get an education and contribute to solutions so that they can move, march forward and hopefully solve some of these issues that we're facing today. I want to highlight that there's two redwoods, as I've already pointed out, and they pose very different problems in terms of conservation and management with respect to climate change and water. The coast redwood here, you can see the zone is shown in the red color, inhabits a very long, narrow zone along the, here the coast of California. And of course, it, it harbors the tallest tree on our planet, Sequoia sempervirens, um, that lives in this coastal zone. There's been an effort underway in establishing reference plots here where we're measuring the trees, getting their heights, many of their metrics to basically quantify what's out there in the forest, mapping the structure and many of the functions in these forests as well. Um, this is a picture from uh, one of the, uh, where, taken by National Geographic photograph, photographers uh, documenting the tallest tree um, in Redwood National Park. These trees are also an incredible ecosystem in themselves. This is a picture at mid-crown of a coast redwood um, up in Northern California with one of our uh, field uh, people were standing in it, Jim Spickler. And one of the things that is important to keep in mind is that we're not only protecting the trees, but we're protecting the ecosystems that are actually in the trees as well. Um, and there's a, there's a very high amount of biodiversity uh, that we never even see until you actually climb up into this tree. So it's important to keep in mind that we're not just looking from the ground level, but we also have to pay attention to what's going on in, in these organisms themselves. It's been said that these, tre these trees and these forests are actually sequestering carbon three to maybe up to five times more than the Amazonian rainforest. So they have the potential to also serve as a very important carbon sink here in California. They also uh, are using water at a rate that rivals the Amazon forest. So the biogeochemical cycles of these forests are actually quite remarkable. You contrast the coast redwood to our other redwood here in California, shown again in the red diagram here, Sequoia dendron gigantean, the, the, the uh, giant sequoia, is actually now found in about 67 isolated groves. It is in the mid-elevation belt in the, in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. You can see largely concentrated near Sequoia Kings National Parks and just outside. And so this is a very different sort of a problem with respect to water. It is in middle elevation, it is very snow dependent, it swings widely between a very cold winter and a very warm, dry, drought prone summer. Despite that, this is also a tree on our planet that uh, has the most mass of any tree that we know on planet Earth. Um, some of you may be familiar with this particular individual, uh, the General Sherman tree up in the giant forest in Sequoia National Park. Um, these are really fun trees to work in hard to get your hands and your heads wrapped around them. He was one of our colleagues, George Koch, who is just descending out of one of the trees that we've been working with. Um, they also have incredible structure and an amazing ability to sequester carbon and actually recycle water in the middle of Asian forests here uh, in the Sierra Nevada. Now the problems that exist for these redwood trees um, really are kind of accentuated in this slide here is that there is massive variation in the amount of water that occurs from north to south along the coast and from low elevation to high elevation in the Sierra Nevada. 
So we can think about uh, precipitation ranging from uh, 1.7 to 3 meters as we go from north to high latitudes. These areas are really impacted largely by a great amount of snowpack, particularly at high elevation. But they also have, as we go to the coast, a very important impact from the fog, which I'll show you, about, uh, show you a little bit more about in a second here. Runoff and groundwater are very important at the, in the northern ends and the higher latitudes um, within the Redwood Ranges. In the south, precipitation declines quite a bit. Snowpack becomes less part of that part um, of the water balance. We do get summertime rains, and some of those rains are monsoonal, coming out of the Gulf of California during the summer months. These areas have less fog, but proportionally that fog sometimes can be actually more important for the coast redwood. And these areas become very warm, hot, and dry um, uh, in summertime. So there are some real differences in terms of what the challenges are with respect to managing water resources and the impacts that those changes in water resources actually have on the redwoods, whether they're living north, south, high, or low in elevation. I mentioned that we live in the Mediterranean climate zone. That means wet, cool, or cold winters, dry, warm, or hot summers. And I think the key thing to take away and a punchline to all of this is that one of the things that we forget about, but we don't forget about it if we work on the plants, is the evaporative conditions really drive a lot of what happens in these forests. And as precipitation patterns change, snowpack declines, temperatures increase, evaporation is increasing. And that leads to an atmospherically imposed water deficit that these forests are having to deal with. Now, these are some data that Michael Fernandez, Miguel Fernandez has provided um, to me. These are data that um, come from all of the permanent weather stations here in California um, that have been uh, averaged together and plotted for the last 115 years for which the data have been gathered. Um, so the zero across these, uh, um, both the temperature and precipitation data, show you basically what the long-term average is. And the deviations above and below that zero line are showing you over this 115-year record where things have deviated significantly. What's striking about this record is you can see with respect to precipitation, we don't see clear trends, the bottom graph here. But if you look at the upper graph, you can see since the 1980s, we clearly have entered into a time of much warmer temperatures throughout California, and some parts of California much more than others. We can plot this a different way by putting it into sectors here. So I have temperature plotted on the vertical axis and precipitation departure uh, plotted on the, on the lower axis. You can see that the baseline is that black dot directly in the middle. And the open symbols are showing you in the normal years. And the gray symbols are showing you the departures. And you can basically find departure years that hit every sector throughout that 115-year um, record. We took this um, information, and we put it into what Chris and Bill had talked about in, in this morning's session, one of the more conservative um, representative concentration pathway scenarios and projected forward what's going to be happening in the next 7, 17, 27, and 37 years into the future to temperature and precipitation. One of the things that you're struck by is that precipitation shows a broad range of oscillation, but it essentially sits kind of right at the middle of the graph, but temperatures just continue to increase. And that means, of course, one thing that's going to happen is more evaporative water losses. Now, one aspect of working on redwoods here in coastal California is paying attention to and being mindful of the fact that they live in a Mediterranean climate where fog is a very important feature of the summertime climate regime. Um, these, uh, despite the fact that they have dry summers, they are the tallest trees on Earth. They fix an amazing amount of carbon. They recycle a tremendous amount of water. And they're very important to the coastal watersheds. Fog formation here on the west coast of California is incredibly important and very, very, very regular. When the summer, in the summer, the central, uh, central um, Pacific high pressure system sort of slides south, uh, that, that moist, warm air that's coming out of the banana belt strikes California where we have very cold upwelling and also cold currents that are coming out of the Gulf of Alaska. 
And if that moist, warm air interacting with that cold water upwelling or those cold currents out of Alaska that leads to the fog banks, the famous one of all the postcards we see for San Francisco or this picture over here from the East Bay Hills. And of course, that cool, moist air at the coast and the hot air inland that hot air rises, that, hot, that air has to be replaced by something. So every single night, those of us live, that live here in the Bay Area know that we get that express that comes in every single night. That fog bank is a tremendous resource. And when we look a little bit more uh, carefully at the fog bank, we see that there's a very uh, nice correspondence to, to the numbers of hours per day that we find fog occurring during the summer months here in California and where we find the coast redwood trees show, highlighted in that red uh, box shown up there. So when we exceed about nine hours per day during our summer months, this also happens to be the zone where we find um, the coastal redwood forests. Now, we've been quantifying fog inputs along the coast for quite a number of years, and this is something that I think strikes a lot of people when they haven't actually looked and thought about the importance of this water resource. Um, you can see that I've got plotted here in these two different graphs, and let's just look at the one on the left, hydrologic input expressed as both rainfall, the blue, the blue bar, and fog input as the yellow bar here. And one of the things prior to 1990 that we had no information on was how important that fog water resource is. As you can see, a third of the moisture of the total hydrologic inputs to the coastal redwood forest actually comes from fog. That isn't measured with our standard precipitation gauges. This fog comes in this way, not that way. And so we began to quantify that as an additional water resource and then ask the next question, how important is it to the ecosystems? And what does it do um, for both the redwood trees themselves? As a, as a note, on the, on the, on the right-hand side of the graph, you can see that when trees are actually removed, um, rainfall changes slightly, but fog inputs, of course, change dramatically. And of course, that makes sense if you think about the fact that fog is coming off the Pacific Ocean this way. If you remove the interception surface, the trees, you remove the ability of those trees to basically strip that moisture source out of that air mass and removing that input actually to the ecosystem itself. Another important point about fog and, and it as a water resource for redwood trees is of course it comes during the summer months when precipitation is largely absent. So again, in this red box here showing you where we have the, the greatest number of fog hours happens to be the time when we have the least amount of precipitation. And of course, plants like water, and they especially like it during summertime when it's warm and the days are long. So no, no precipitation, but fog inputs become a very important part of the story of understanding uh, the ecohydrology of redwood trees and redwood forests. Now, an aspect of what we've been doing here in coastal California to understand the importance of fog is also to understand how fog has been changing. And in a paper that we published in 2010, we began to go back to the weather records that took us back all the way 100 years or more and began to look at the correspondence between the temperature difference, the red uh, tri upward pointing triangles versus the blue downward pointing tri triangles, so we're looking at the difference in temperature between the coast and the inland and plotting that temperature difference against the fog frequency shown in the right-hand upper diagram. You can see there's a remarkable correspondence that when the temperature dis difference is very, very small, the fog frequency actually declines. When the temperature difference is large, the fog frequency actually goes up. So in other words, the power of the conveyor belt is much better when we have a greater temperature difference between coastal temperature and inland temperature, which is driving that fog advection onto shore every night. Now, the humbling thing that came out of this analysis was extending this record back in time. And when we began to do that and looking at both fog frequency and temperature difference, one of the things that we noticed is that not only the temperature difference between coastal zones and inland zones has been declining over the years by about four degrees over the last century, but along with that temperature difference decline has been a fog decline, about a 30 to 35% difference in that water resource that is coming into the coastal redwood forest. Basically, we're losing that water subsidy um, during the summer months that we know is an important one for the plants. If we turn our attention to the, the western part 
of North America and look at the other types of water that are impacting now giant sequoia, the, the redwood tree that lives in the Sierra Nevada mountains, this, is, this was also highlighted this morning, where we see ch massive changes in the snowpack. And if you just look at the colors up here on these uh, four different panels shown for February, March, April, and May for the western parts of the United States, they are red colors showing you that largely our snowpack water contents are declining, and they have been declining pretty steadily since the 1950s up through 2008. There's only a few places here that show up as blue colors, kind of the southern Sierra Nevada, where we might actually be gaining uh, a little bit more snowpack. Um, but for the most part, we're looking at water deficits. We're looking at a loss of the water resources that are supporting those giant sequoia forests um, in the Sierra Nevada. Part of that is driven by this, the changes in temperature, which has already been talked about quite a bit already. So if, again, if you look at these maps for February, March, April, and May, and you look at the colors there, most of the places where snowpack has been on the decline are also places where temperature has been on the increase. And so it's no surprise that as we get warmer temperatures, we're going to get a little, we're going to get smaller snowpacks, less water resources. And those water resources are, of course, very important in not only uh, sustaining the redwood forests, but they are our runoff. They're the things that are recharging our groundwater aquifers, ending up in the stream, affecting stream organisms like salmonids, etc. So it cascades all the way through the hydrologic system here in the western part of North America. All of this change in both temperature and water is leading to mostly water deficits everywhere. If you look at this map here, again, Miguel Fernandez, Heidi Hamilton, and Laura Cuppers have pr provided this. Um, you can see that most of the colors up here are greens, reds, and yellows, which means water deficit, a time during July when we fall below what these systems, in a natural sense, require to sustain a healthy growth and healthy water use. So we're entering into a time where water, stuff, water deficits is actually the new norm. We got interested then in asking the question, if we go into the water deficit, what happens to then the water use in these forests? And there's a number of ways that we can begin to, quanti begin to quantify that. We can very simply begin to ask the question, how has evaporation, E up here, and transpiration, that water that's actually being used by the vegetation itself, how do they differ between the coast redwood and the giant sequoia? And you can see that there is quite a marked difference in uh, how much evaporation is, dry, is, is affecting these coastal forests, only 12 to 19 percent. Most of the water is actually moving through the trees. When we go to the giant sequoia, um, there's still quite a, a large fraction moving through the trees, but a lot more leaving through evaporation. These are much more open forests much more influenced by warmer temperatures, lower humidity, and a greater evaporative water loss out of the soil than through the tree itself. For comparison's sake, you can see that really the coast redwood forests come closer to looking like a tropical forest than do the giant sequoia forests. Now this wasn't enough, of course. We needed to know how evaporation and transpiration were changing, but we really wanted to put it into the context of how the entire hydrologic balance might be changing. So we began to use um, a, a model uh, the RESA simulator to basically look at not only what the uh, partitioning of the water, re the different parts of the, the hydrologic cycle, both today and into the future, and also with respect to the northern and the southern end. Now, this is for coast redwood. So the top number in each one of these boxes is your, is your northern data. The bottom number is your southern data. For today's conditions, and then projecting forward uh, using uh, temperature and precipitation data to 2040. And one of the things you can see for, for the coast redwood here is that, for the most part, things are going in a negative direction. Transpiration is declining. Soil evaporation is actually increasing. Evaporation off of canopy, so that's the water intercepted by a canopy and then re-evaporated back into the atmosphere, is actually declining. The runoff is declining. Deep drainage is declining. So overall, the total ET is actually um, going down in these coast redwood forests. If we contrast that to the giant sequoia, it's kind of a different story here. And one of the things that emerges here is that the southern end of this uh, redwoods range is actually, actually going to be in a better condition. Um, in the future than it is today, and the northern end is actually going to be suffering. 
I don't have time to talk about this because David gave me the one minute mark here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the punchline here. Um, and to skip past the first two points, which are things that I've already made in the data, I want to get to the last two here. And that's really thinking about the future of these forests. And I think one of the things that we have to keep in mind is the future of land use change as well. How, this pop, how population growth here in California and the demand for the water resources may continue to put pressures on the streams and the things that are also going to be impacting the forests that are actually upstream. So human population growth, water management policies, and all those surprises that come out of climate change that, um, that we certainly just don't even know about yet are going to be things that are going to have to be thought of in terms of how they shape uh, policy and management going forward. I think for the management of both our redwood species, we're really learning that science can play a role and that understanding how we take scientific knowledge, merge that with the stakeholders that are really interested in these forests and what they provide both in a natural science sense, but also, as I said, for the timber industry, for how they affect uh, streams, et cetera, and then working with non-governmental organizations like the Save the Redwood League, I think that partnership is going to be the way we're going to be able to move forward to better manage in the future. We're not going to do it alone as scientists. The, the non-governmental organizations are not going to do it alone by engaging the public. It's going to take a partnership, and I think it's going to take these kinds of unique partnerships, I think, uh, going into the future. So there is no time for questions. We'll in the panel. In the panel. Let's see. So thank you.